Okay, so uh, I'm going to give the least technical presentation that's ever been given here in SecDSM history on uh, next generation vendor risk management. I also want to thank Logarithm for sponsoring us tonight. Uh, the hard alcohol is from them. And uh, thank you, James, for showing us how to update the website. Um, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have a lot of tangents. So I like things to be interactive. I like to be interrupted. So if you want to interrupt and interject at any time, there's always value in tangents. We're also going to talk about risk management as a methodology. Uh, real briefly, vendor risk management is the heart of the presentation. Uh, real stories from security MSSPs, because in my experience, Every provider that I've done a risk assessment on in security has been terrible. Uh, so security as an industry is not very good at their own internal control environments. So we'll talk about some stories there. Uh, tricks of the trade. So I'm going to talk about some methodologies I use to um, kind of better protect our company. And there's a risk dump at the end. So if you're interested in cloud services and all the risks involved with those um, and want to use that to kind of better write contracts and other things. Uh, we're going to hit a few high levels of just all the risks that you can imagine associated with the cloud service um, and uh, go from there. So I'm going to start with a probable bad day in information security. Uh, which may include data theft of the wrong kind, account, account takeover activity, a third party, third party, third party breach. Anyone been a victim of a third party, third party, third party breach? Okay, so I'm the only one, the only, the only breach information, like your, con your information has been compromised letter I've ever gotten was because of a third party, third party, third party. Now, we're not actually going to go into how you prevent that. We're going to stick with just third party and third parties, but... That's a bad day. Um, DDoS, insider fraud. Uh, but here is, in terms of risk management, probably the most probable bad days. And this is going to offend a few people in the room, but this is when the security team finds out that the company does not exist to run an information security program. That is a likely bad day for an engineer. Another likely bad day is uh, when security spending is a business decision anchored in the business economic engine. It's when you want to get something in your network to protect it, and you can't because they don't want to buy it, right? That's a bad day. Or when the security team shoots the business in the foot, and that's their economic engine, um, people really get upset when they can't reach their business apps because of a security agent, uh, when their machine doesn't start up, when they can't do certain things. So. Who here, maybe besides Nick, actually doesn't work for a business? Like your military, your police force. So mo most of us do. So there are business realities to security, and that's one of the things that we're going to talk about tonight, is a few of those. Um, so if you work for a business, and you work in security, there's... A meeting in the middle and usually we don't talk about those kind of things here at SecDSM but when we're talking about vendor risk and risk management in general it's an important topic so I like risk management uh, that's why I'm in management but it's because the world is a risky place no one makes it out alive uh, risk management applies to everything so some of the uh, great risk management people in the security field will do things like they'll run a risk analysis on the boy who wants to take out their daughter on a date and determine whether or not that this is a likely, happy, probable, good ending for their child. Or when you go and buy a car, what's the risk that that car is going to break down? Or if you, any type of life decision really is a risk management decision. Because basically risk is talk about loss exposure. It's the probable frequency, probable magnitude of some kind of future loss, preferably in dollar amounts. And we're really bad at this. So as a human race, uh, we're not very good at discerning risks, especially future risks. 
economists estimate that human civilization is still years away from turning a profit. This is an Onion article that was posted. If any of you guys read The Onion, one of my more favorable ways, but we won't read this whole quote, but it's the idea that throughout human history we're still in the negative, right? We haven't turned a profit yet. Um, but I like this one a little bit better. So these two guys, Moeller and Stewart, um, asserted in a paper that uh, 3,292 Americans, not counting those in war zones, were killed by terrorists uh, between 1970 and 2007, which is an annual risk of one in 3.5 million. So your actual risk of being killed by a terrorist is one in 3.5 million. Now, if we look at a few other risks, Americans were most likely to die in an accident involving a bathtub, one in 950,000. So you're far more likely, according to this particular study, to slip and fall and die in your bathtub than you are get killed by a terrorist. Home appliance, one in 1.5 million. So beware of your toaster. Uh, and you think about that when you stand in a TSA line. Struck by lightning, one in 960,000. Struck by lightning twice, one in 900 million. That's an aggregate over the course of your entire lifespan risk. Or here in Iowa, a deer, one in two million. So and we, had, we didn't even get the cancer, smoking, obesity. Those are actually more likely. Is that yes. hit a deer or killed by a deer? This is killed by a deer, like pod. All right, <laughs> just so just so we're clear. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I mean, anyways, you know, you know what I mean. Uh, right. Anyways. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's not. No, that was an excellent question. Thank you for interrupting. Um, so. There, I'm getting at a little point here from a security management perspective. Okay, the really big scary things in information security are probability events. And that's the point I'm trying to explain. They're one in something that this really bad thing that we're trying to protect is going to happen. But information security to a business person of which everyone except for a couple of people here are ultimately accountable to is about putting things in place to reduce loss exposure, so risk, in order to be more profitable in the long term. Because the idea is you don't want a major loss event because that cuts into your profits, right? Okay. So this is a little tangent. Is being paranoid really required? Was this sysadmin, net administrator, security person in general? We've got a nice little argument. I'm not at liberty to answer that question. I'm not paranoid. They really are out to get me. Just because they really are out to get you doesn't mean that you're not paranoid. No, he's quite astute. We really are out to get him. You don't need to be paranoid, but it helps. So I put it this way, because this comes up in at least our profession a lot, this idea of I'm hiring a security professional and I want someone paranoid because they're gonna check underneath everything, underneath the bed and the drawers and the closet They're gonna, to look for this attacker, right? They're gonna be a really good security personnel. So the problem with that is that in my perspective, Paranoia is simply the result of ineffective risk management. Or paranoia is the art of overthinking. Literally creating problems that aren't there and wasting a lot of business money in order to do it. Um, if you are a business leader, you understand that the biggest risk to your business is having one. And that security is just one of many financially damaging possibilities that exist. So uh, Casey's for an example, uh, our headquarters are right next to an airport. If a private plane flies into our warehouse, blows shit up, we can't send out food to our stores, that's gonna have a loss event much greater than an attack. If one of our gas trucks traveling down the road explodes, takes out a bridge, kills a bunch of people, it's probably gonna cost more than the piece of malware we discovered last week. Um, the uh, foodborne illness, if suddenly every Casey's has like some kind of bacteria, like, and no one buys a pizza, that's gonna be a loss event much greater than cybersecurity. So if you're a CEO and you're sitting in the chair 
and you're looking at your enterprise risk management strategy, cyber is just one thing. And, I, and sometimes I think that's important for us to, uh, to understand because, of course, we have to think security is the most important thing, and rightly so, because that's what we work in. Um, however, it's one line item of a bunch of ones. So, in a sense, frameworks exist to manage risk, to create some kind of peace of mind, um, to know that you're aware of loss exposure possibilities and are in the driver's seat. You're managing, you're mitigating, accepting, transferring that risk based on your risk appetite. And the reason why we do that is because we can't cover every single risk that exists to a business. If we do, we make less money. So quote at the bottom, how many here would like their paycheck cut in order so that there are no security risks to the business? Probably nobody. But that's the reality if you're sitting in a business leader financial chair. Um, so this idea of paranoia, which is, will come up later in this um, presentation, I actually prefer to think about security in terms of, I want knowledgeable people. I want highly creative people. Um, I want uh, motivated people. Um, because security is kind of a creative field, um, if we think about it in that way. Uh, I think the best way to understand that is in terms of logic. So if you're developing code, your inputs need to equal certain things and then lead to some kind of standard output. And it's all very, you input this, you get this, and then you pass that variable on to the next one, yada, yada, on down the line. It's very much, here's a one, here's a zero, here's a logical output. Risk management, not so much at all. So you, you take in all these different factors, you analyze them, you come up with a probability on a bell curve of something that might happen, and then it may have these impacts if it does. And so your inputs don't always equal your outputs. And that's kind of like life. So if you're a really, really logical person, you should go see a therapist. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, um, no, but if you're, you have to be willing to accept certain things, certain realities, right? And so we'll get into managing vendor risk, but the certain realities that you have to accept is just the things that you can't really do anything about that your vendors may be presenting to you. And so one of the ways that we manage risk is through RCMs. Who knows what RCM stands for? Besides Ben. Nobody, great. So RCM is a risk and control matrix. So this is the other side of the security fence. This is your GRC teams that everyone makes fun of, right? Like wondering how, why we need more people and governance, risk and compliance and actual technology and in some cases. And so that's what they do. They create a risk and control matri matrix. They list out all the risks. Here's all the controls to mitigate those risks um, in a spreadsheet like form or something along those lines. And when you look at that from a technology perspective, you're like, if I have a hacker on my network and I take my RCM and I throw it, the paperwork at the ethernet cable, it's really ineffective, right? You can't actually defend your network. And that's because an RCM is not designed to protect you. It's designed to govern and manage risk for people who are really concerned about that kind of stuff, like CEOs, VPs, directors. Um, So again, another disappointing reality, maybe for this room, right? Because you didn't know what an RCM was, but uh, the, perhaps the most single effective countermeasure of a, well, uh, of a security program is a well-managed security program. Um, if you kind of look back at a lot of different attack vectors, um, most of the time it's a process that wasn't followed, created some kind of residual effect that someone then took advantage of. Um, and uh, in a lot of cases, you had this huge gap on your network or someone put a device out on the internet, like a legacy um, application just kind of left it there. And that was the entry point. So a lot of these, though they had a technical aspect to it, it really comes down to the program overall was pretty poorly managed. And there was this big gap sitting out there that was a problem that nobody knew about until some hacker comes in and reveals that you have a problem. And a lot of times it's a management problem. So if we switch gears to 
vendor risk a little bit. I think this is kind of the idea that uh, the industry has. This is my favorite John Strand picture, by the way. I stole this from John Strand. Uh, the, <laughs> I, I think a lot of times with, with vendors and security, this is what we do. We will say, uh, here's my data that I'm giving this provider. I have very little confidence in my cost contained and resource strapped security program. So I'm going to add this as a service type cloud company. And then it's unicorns and rainbows from there. Like everything's solved. It's all good. I don't really need to do any more work. And how do I know this is true? I know this is true because every time I buy a cloud service, I VRM the shit out of my cloud vendors and they can never give me anything that gives me any indication that their internal control environment, that their risks are well managed, that they actually know what's wrong in their environment or doing something about it. Um, a lot of times that leads to the CISO getting on the phone. So if you're ever in a position where you're talking to a CISO of a, like a major security vendor, um, it's because they're damage controlling you. They're thinking we're going to lose this sale. I don't even, I hate this thing. I hate this thing in my All right. Everybody hear me right? It was like beaconing. Okay. All right, so if you're, if you're on the phone with the CISO uh, of a cloud vendor organization, it's pretty much because their internal control environment sucks and they're trying to damage control you. And I've been on several of these conversations. I have a few stories to tell about this, but uh, um, you can pretty much assure that they're lying to you in some regard. So let me give you an example. We were looking at a vendor that was Sorry. Hello, live stream. Okay, so we were looking at <laughs> we were looking at a a vendor, a really reputable one. If I were to give you the name of this vendor, everyone in this room would know them. They are they're highly technical vendor, and we're just looking at a product that they had hosted in the cloud. Um, so so I mean, one of the first things when I got on the phone with the CISO um, that I asked him, I was like, "Where's two FA login into my cloud app?" Because he was telling me that I should be assured that they have proper internal controls over my data that I'm giving them um, because they use two-factor internally. So they two-factor into a jump host and they use that to update their code to AWS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I asked them, well, if you two-factor protect your data, then why doesn't my cloud login have two-factor protection? Like, why don't you give a shit about my data? Um, of course, no solid good answer there. The reason why I got on this phone call in the first place is because we asked for a simple thing called a SOC 2 Type 2 report, which we're going to talk about in, like, in a little bit. And they didn't have one. So what they sent me was a SOC overview at a station by probably the CEO's best friend who happens to work for like a big four or some kind of assessment firm that basically says, hey, we looked at their controls and they're okay. It's like signature. And I'm just supposed to like accept this. Um, which we did not. So we pushed a little further. We actually, so they, then they sent us AWS's SOC 2 type report, SOC 2 type 2 report, so we could review AWS, but it didn't actually conclude on their internal control environment. Like, what about their code? What about the OF's top 10 vulnerabilities? How are they patching their stuff? Um, like, how well is their own data center or however they're running their business? How well is that protected? Just basic questions about whether or not I can trust you with my data and if you're going to handle it well, um, nothing. So we have this $72 billion industry that's going more and more towards cloud solutions, uh, which is the security industry. And I have yet to get a solid internal control report with test evidence about what they're doing. Tom's surprised. He's like, what? Business solver? We, we have this under wraps. So a VRM program, a vendor risk management program, does my vendor have their act together? That's really all that we're trying to determine. I want to be able to conclude on the effectiveness of their internal control environment over my data, right? And this shouldn't be any different than my own security program. So if my own security program, if I take these precautions, if I put in these type controls, I want to know that those controls are very similar to uh, what they're 
using. So I'm just basically comparing my program with their, their program. If I'm going to go to the cloud, there should be better, right? And that's the idea. Um, DRM includes risk scoring vendors um, and periodic reviews to see if they are lapsing in their ability to protect my data. Um, so we give them risk levels. And then it may include things like mitigating that risk. So I discover a major risk in a cloud vendor. What am I going to do about it? Well, I may add contract language. I may do an on-site audit. I may not buy that service. Uh, that's all mitigating risks there. I might accept it. The service might be so valuable that there are terrible controls over my data. I might just go with it. Uh, I might transfer it. I might look at insurance or limitation of liability and warranty provisions in the contract. I might actually transfer it to them. Um, allow me to sue them for more money if they screw up. So these are all kind of actions that VRM is trying to determine which route the best route to take or multiple routes. So basic, really high level, how do you go about assessing a vendor? First thing I'm going to look at is business criticality and data classification. So what kind of data am I sending to this provider and how critical is their availability to my business being able to perform what it needs to do is going to ultimately lead to some kind of weight riskiness determination approach. Um, I'm basically, I'm going to give them a risk score and I'm going to weight that. So like if I have a cloud vendor who's just receiving temperature controls from my freezers, I don't really care if somebody hacks in and finds out that our freezers are 20 below Celsius, not a big deal. Now, if I had a really major problem, maybe with temperature that led to some kind of foodborne illness that someone discovered and then released publicly, that might be a big problem. But for the most part, just someone looking at my temperature controls online, not a big deal if they get hacked. So maybe I don't care about that. But if I'm sending maybe all my security alerts or if the business is sending say social security numbers in terms of hosted HRIS systems like ADP, you know, those like that. Um, I might actually care a lot more about how they're protecting my data. And then I'm going to use this to determine my approach. And like all things breach related, it really isn't simple or easy to determine how do you approach assessing a vendor um, in a kind of worthwhile way. So I'm ultimately going to take that weight and that risk score and calculate something on this vendor and that's going to determine my actions. So maybe I do it on site. Maybe I just accept the SOC 2 type 2 um, report. Uh, maybe I actually periodic review them quarterly. Maybe it's twice a year. Maybe it's annually depending on how important this data is and how much I want to stay on top of it. Um, so that's a really high level. Any questions about that? Yeah. Yeah, we just did. Monday, Tuesday this week, we sent two people to a, um, a provider. It was, yeah, it was a startup, 16 person software company. So we asked for their controls, like, hey, just how are you protecting our data? And they're like, we don't have anything. And, <laughs> and so, so we're like, well, we're going to come on site and audit you. And we did. And the whole on site was, was reviewing their procedures and we spent a lot of time with their CTO who was apparently very, very arrogant and drove a car with a license plate that said three commas. Anyone, anyone watch Silicon Valley around here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess they're they're putting, I don't know, anyways, they didn't put the radio on the internet, but um, they, <laughs> I, but I don't know, apparently I thought he was gonna get there or something, but, uh, but yeah, we did, we did an on-site audit. Um, for sure, and, and part of the reason why we did it is we're experimenting with VRM programs at my company. We're trying to figure out the best way to do it at Casey's. Uh, and so this particular project, we said, you know what? If we had an infinite time and budget and people, we're going to take this thing from the beginning all the way through a procurement process that doesn't exist to an end as if this was like, like our life depended on it. We were just going to test, test run this kind of assessing a vendor this way, um, and then it just turned out that they didn't have really good documentation, so we went on site and audited.
Um, so here's the thing. We're talking about approaches to VRM, right? Investors get it. Why doesn't information security? This is one of my questions. So if you're looking at investing in a company, a really solid investment strategy is going to include this top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. So top down, they're looking at their macroeconomic picture, like the really big general sweeping picture. But that doesn't give you enough details about what's actually going on in this company. So they're going to go bottom up. They're going to look at history of earnings and growth, positive earnings, surprises, a bunch of stuff that maybe people in this room don't care about. But the idea is you're going to get in the middle is the best way. I got this huge sweeping type assessment with the, all this very detailed analysis. I'm going to meet in the middle. I'm going to create a big picture. So let's put this in information security terms. Like, so I contract out to a big four auditing firm, Ernst & Young, Deloitte, uh, KPMG, PwC, one of these people, right? And they come in and they assess my environment for risk. All right, so th they might throw in an appliance, like a Dumballa appliance, do a little C2 analysis, but that's about as technical as they're really gonna get. They might send a pen tester and do some basic, like, can I get domain admin testing? That's probably it. The rest of it is show me your policies and procedures for this. Show me your policies and procedures for this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then they crank out a risk report and that risk report is gonna, think, gonna have things like your SIM isn't strong enough. Your DLP program needs to be increased or et cetera, et cetera. There's huge sweeping big categories, right? My job's on the line if the company gets hacked and they're not gonna get hacked from a SIM perspective. They're not gonna get hacked because of their DLP program and their lack of policies and procedures. They're going to get hacked because they did something dumb or they didn't adequately put in technological control. Something like a CI, CIS top 20 critical controls and everything that's in that framework. Very, very specific line items about how to secure DNS, how to secure configurations, asset management, uh, your pen testing strategy, this kind of holistic picture of really highly technical controls that any pen tester might find one little bitty one and exploit that and then try to gain a foothold in the network. Well, they're not going to look at that and then they're going to give you a report of like 10 things you need to do that actually won't protect you from a hacker. And that report goes to the board and then the board's like, when are you going to do these 10 things? And that's oftentimes how a security program is run because it's top down. That's what I'm saying. Everything's top down. It's really high level basic stuff that doesn't get into the weeds and the real problems with technical security. There's no bottom up approach and we don't do anything different in terms of vendor risk management. It's usually like some kind of top down approach. So when we look at our vendors, we typically look at some kind of certification or attestation. Are you FedRAMP certified? Do you have a certification for ISO 20, 27001? We might go then to control reports. So there's this progression in the industry, SAS 70, then it was SA, SSAE 16, and now we've got SOC 1, 2, and 3, type 2, or type 1, type 2 reports. Um, I included a link if you want to go understand the difference of these reports. You might not. But then we use questionnaires. So if any of you are thinking about questionnairing a cloud vendor, I included a uh, GitHub link to Google's uh, security vendor questionnaire. Uh, it's really web code that you can throw up on your own site, host it, and then send it out to your vendors and they can fill things out and it comes back in automatically. It's a nice, easy approach to do it. Um, and then there's guided conversations and, and references. So this is all like the tip of the iceberg. It's this top-down approach. Here's the problem. Their network, their code writing, how they scan that code, um, the uh, how they update their change management processes all the way to um, what they're hosting externally, right, doesn't really get covered. So there's this massive under the surface, really technical type based stuff that is typically cause for paranoia. But as I just told you, paranoia is bad risk management. So what I'm saying is if we're going to take vendor risk management to the next level, uh, I think we need to think about approaches that are going to get under the surface here, more towards the iceberg underneath the ocean. Um, so let's, we'll take a look at some common pitfalls and some problems with this basic approach. So if I get a certification and attestation, here's an example of one. Uh, it basically says blah, 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 blah. We came in, we looked at your ISMS. Uh, 
ISO 27000 certification. It was great. Thumbs up. And uh, here's my name, Mr. Auditor, signed at the bottom. Take my word for it. On your merry way. And you're like, my security program's terrible. They're certainly doing better than me. Sign up, unicorns and rainbows. Un unicorns and rainbows with a cat with a pistol, right? That's kind of what we're going for. The only problem is no control test evidence. So you received a report that said, hey, all good. But they didn't actually tell you, well, what did you test? What did you actually look at? What even questions did you ask when you went in and did this assessment? Not there. Question? Yeah, okay, great, yeah. So and the, the next thing to pile on then is, well, there's nothing in an MSA. So you went through, you reviewed their ISO 27000 certification, but you went to go contract with them and they didn't even reference it. So you did this whole review process. It doesn't matter because it's not part of the agreement. Um, after you read it, it really has no bearing on the agreement unless you specifically request to add that they maintain that certification or something else, right? So it's kind of like smoke and mirrors um, a little bit. Um, other problems, subjective opinion of a paid assessor of the company could be anyone. Um, honestly, assessor more often than not struggles to understand technology. Uh, they're not engineers, they're not pen testers, they are you know, assessors. Uh, so you get this top down check mark, but there's what, bottom up holes everywhere? Um, and then a uh, quick note on cyber insurance so who here knows that cyber insurance as a thing is going to supposedly grow 60 percent in the next three to five years right so that's information is kind of out there well uh fico everyone knows fico scores well, fico now is scoring vendors so you can go through as an assessment and you can get a score for how secure your network is like a numerical score uh, and that's supposed to be used for cyber insurance like how much should my premium be um, so obviously that's flawed probably sucks right now but the thing is that's the beginning and it's only going to get better so underwriters are trying to figure out how do I appropriately charge for a cyber insurance premium and when they get that figured out there will be another standard and some way to quantitatively analyze vendors score them and then use that uh, for vendor risk management However, there is nothing right now. So if you don't like attestations and certifications, you can just go straight for a SOC 2 type 2 report. Uh, the problem is, is you're going to have the same issues as certifications and attestations uh, on the MSA, uh, subjective assessor type stuff. But you get control evidence, right? So this is what you're going to see in a SOC 2 type 2 report. You're going to see what tests they performed on that particular control. So that's great, uh, except that it creates a nice false sense of security. Um, so one of the things you're going to want to look for in a SOC 2 type report is exceptions, like uh, this was missing. So you'll want to find that in the report, and then you want to go back to the company, the, the vendor you're assessing, and say, hey, what are you doing about this? Did you do anything? Do you have anything in place now? So that's one thing. And the other thing that's going to be missing is you won't see anything on mispatches on critical services like SSL, SSH, DNS, um, that provide remote command, prompt access, or facilitate DOS attacks. They aren't going to look at that, right? Completely out. Uh, you won't find anything on OWASP Top 20 if you're looking at a SAS solution. That's completely out. You won't find these in SOC 2 Type 2 reports. Um, so you're going to have this report that says, hey, things are pretty good over here. We tested it. It's all right. There's a few exceptions. Maybe you should ask about those. But for the most part, keep going. Unicorns and rainbows. Their security program looks better than mine because they actually have controls to test. So great. The problem with that really doesn't get at these bottom up kind of more technical controls. So you got this false sense of security. But however, it's a really good doorway to reviewing a vendor to kind of see, well, if they have a SOC 2 type 2, you're on the right track. Like they're, the vendor's doing something. They actually have activity here. It's better than a certification and attestation. Uh, so a couple of things you want to watch for is CUEC, is Complementary User Entity Controls. So these are things that you have to do to make this whole protect my data picture complete. So there's always things on your end that you need to have in place, like access controls to your SaaS solution. 
Um, they're going to call that out in a SOC 2 type report and say, well, if you don't control access, then that could lead to a breach and therefore you might not be 100% protected. But probably the most important one is a section on subservice providers. These are the SaaS solutions third parties, and they should disclose those third parties and who they're using in a subservice provider section. And then you can ask for those subservice providers for their SOC 2 type 2 if they're a data center or hosting facility. Um, if they're sending your data elsewhere, you're going to want to review that third party. Um, so that's where you get that one step third party, third party kind of step is in a SOC 2 type 2. Um, in terms of next gen vendor risk management, uh, can we get pen test results? So show me your pen test results in the last year and what you did about that, right? That's missing from a SOC 2 type 2 report, not included. Or how about vulnerability assessments? Uh, show me your scan evidence and where your infrastructure lies in terms of vulnerabilities. Or maybe just run an open source SSL lab scan against their website, see how they're handling encryption. Are they being negligent just in what you negotiate in terms of you know, of HTTPS encryption and other checks that SSL Labs does. Um, and then technical assessment tools. There's plenty of those out there um, in the vendor risk management space. There's people kind of doing things that are more quantitative and technical uh, than just a SOC 2 type 2 report. And they're typically commercial solutions that you can buy uh, to varying degrees of success. I honestly don't use any of them or have any interest in it, but they're out there. Um, and it does streamline some things. So the second, third thing that often happens is questionnaires, guided conversations, and references, right? Talk to other customers, uh, send out your questionnaire, like how are you handling cross-site scripting attacks, and et cetera, et cetera. And then they'll send you back. And of course, they're going to be 100% honest because no one would ever lie to lose a sale. Um, <laughs> that was a good one, Steve. <laughs> Uh, it's good having the vendors here, right? <laughs> just creativity, right? Um. <laughs> All right, so this is where this is where the conversation with the CISO. I've been on the phone with a couple of CISOs. Why? Because there's no attestation, certification, no SOC 2 type 2 report. So the next thing they go to is a... Uh, Surely he'll talk to our CISO. Our CISO will say, you know what? We're doing these amazing things. We have this state-of-the-art security. We didn't document it. We didn't test it. We don't really know if it works, but I'm the CISO and I'm really cool because I work at this like really profitable security company. So just believe me, unicorns and rainbows, and you're there. Um, doesn't work because it's great, but like CISOs lie. I don't know if you guys know this, but like CISOs lie to make a sale. Um, so they'll tell you they have things in place. They just won't be honest about whether or not they're working, right? So it's like, that's great. I believe you that you're doing all these really cool things with open source tools and are saving money and are making your company profitable. But can you test them and put them in a report for me? And that's like all I'm asking for, right? Um, so that usually doesn't work with me. shouldn't work with you guys. Well, you have any confident that any of it is true and, and that it might all be right so that's why i have this into the microphone plenty of hope an infinite amount of hope but none for us there we go okay <laughs> there is hope there's just not any for us all right uh okay <laughs> i'm gonna provide some hope anyways okay so I once asked Tom Pohl, I was like, hey, Tom, how did you get really good at capture the flag? And he said, I'm too stupid to give up. And so we, sh we shouldn't give up. Shouldn't give up, right? OK. All right, so here's this idea of it's bottom-up technical assessment, right? These are the pieces that are missing. These are the information we really want about this organization that we're thinking about doing business with that we can't quite get through typical top-down approaches. Um, and here, here's the philosophical point. At what time does the fear of a data breach warrant just keeping the solution in-house, right? There's this sentiment in VRM world that if you're this paranoid about your data being breached, maybe SaaS isn't for you, okay? Problem is, is that they kind of use that as a crutch and then they don't 
do the right thing in protecting your data. So there's this weird middle ground which always exists in security that you can start to kind of chip away at. But if you're looking for absolute certainty that your data is going to be okay with this vendor, then you should probably just protect it yourself. Um, that's one way of looking at it. Um, but really, what I'm saying is everything is kind of funneled through risk management, which President Trump's paranoia. That was a joke. Um, <laughs> so it goes back to the, the basic VRM thing, right? We classify data, we look at its business criticality, and then we weight the risk that this vendor presents to our economic status as a business then we choose what we want to do. So if it's so mission critical and the data is so sensitive, maybe we just keep it in house. Um, if we're gonna ship it out, then maybe we do try to get some pen test results, like up the technical assessment and still do the top down assessment approach. Um, it's just, when you start scrutinizing a company's really minute technical details, it becomes, high, it has a lot of overhead with that. There's a lot of cost. There's a lot of cost in sending someone in an on-site audit. So it gets really costly pretty fast. Um, so a couple of things I'm going to talk about real quick is how contracts are your friends, uh, how you can mitigate and transfer risk via contract. Um, and then, but just going through this process and just t telling your vendor like, hey, can you send me your pen test results? Right? They don't want you to ask those questions because they don't want to give them to you. So the more that we just make these people really uncomfortable, like when the CISO gets on the phone and is trying to convince you all as well, and you come loaded with some like really great questions about, I need evidence from your technical controls perspective, they're gonna start doing that because they're gonna realize, hey, I've got a competitive advantage is if I can just give all this information up front. So like props to Business Solver for providing a lot of information up front before the deal even begins, I think Tom said once, but for us, ServiceNow, uh, we use that Casey's, before we even got started with them, they just sent us a boatload of information. Here's everything we got that we know you're gonna ask. Uh, and that's a really good, strong start for a software as a service provider um, is to start doing stuff like that. Uh, they're just not gonna do it if we don't ask for it. So if we keep approaching the vendor community as my program kind of sucks and yours is probably better than mine, and so I'm just gonna accept that and move on, then they're not gonna get better because they don't have to. So a few pro tips, uh, focus is one. So a big VRM program might be too costly. If you're State Farm, they had nine full-time people and nine consultants doing vendor risk management for the entire company. Uh, that was, that's a lot of people, like that's 18 people. It's like more people than is in principles, technical security program. Just doing vendor risk management at State Farm. <laughs> and so, so that might be too costly. So given the limits of the traditional kind of top-down approaches, um, you know, you can you can really kind of zero in on what's the things I really care about. Like, I, okay, maybe I don't care about your attestation because I can't verify it. Maybe your control report's inadequate. I'm just gonna go straight for the pen test. Just give me the pen test. That's all I wanna see is the pen test. So you might have all these different VRM boxes um, of things you could check. You might be like, you know what? Questionnaires are out because they're gonna lie. Attestations don't care. What are the three primary things that you care the most about? Just go after that like, like you're going for a jugular and just forget everything else. And then that little minute picture in there will tell the full story and maybe determine what you want to do. Um, and some things you might want to do is uh, put VRM checks in contracts. So give yourself an out. Um, this is an example of a contract that uh, I have with a software as a service provider. Um, we, in this particular example, they told us, CISO got on the phone, told me, hey, we're gonna be FedRAMP certified. We just won't be there for 18 more months. We're just getting started in this thing. So trust us. And I said, I'll trust you with contract language. So here it is, FedRAMP certification. You don't complete it in 18 months, I'm out, right? Put it in the contract. Um, and then if you can't provide it by the deadline, Okay, I'll take a SOC 2 Type 2 report. They were like, oh, we didn't really want to do that. It costs us money. I'm like, I don't care. If you don't give me a SOC 2 Type 2 report, then I'm going to come on site and audit you, and you're going to pay for it. That was what, that was what I pitched to them. Um, so, I mean, I've got, I build in kind of a bunch of outs into this 
particular contract so that if if they don't present a control environment that I'm comfortable with, then then I can move on without consequence. Uh, so it's going back to when you read a, a certification, make sure that they keep getting certified every year. So take your certifications, put them in the contract. Um, you'll notice how serious vendors get as soon as things make it into the contract, right? So if you're talking with a vendor like Steve on the phone, <laughs> You know, like, he'll tell you a lot of really great things, and they may or may not be true. <laughs> but here's the thing, when, when you, when, <laughs> take the boo, so, but here's the thing, when you go to sign the contract, it's going to say, this contract supersedes all conversations, everything you've ever discussed, anything that's ever been on the table is all gone. This language in the contract is all that exists. And so make sure you get in the contract whatever you want to persist and exist in this relationship, is all I'm saying. Um, next one is an important one, raise limitation of liability. Uh, it's this statement. right here will not exceed five times the cumulative amount paid by customer so who knows what limitation of liability is limitation of liability is the amount you can sue for when things go bad right and they always want they want to cap this if you do enough business in the security industry you'll find out there's a 72 billion dollar industry they don't warrant the effectiveness of any of their products. No one's going to put in there, we're going to stop like 100% of attacks. They should put, we're going to stop 75%, something along those lines, but they don't even warrant that. They warrant nothing. And then the limitation of liability is, is always really low so that if, if they don't do their job, if something happens, if you get breached, you know, if you paid like 100 grand, that's how much you can sue for. Well, you know, you just lost a bunch of data. The product didn't detect anything and you're out millions of dollars and you're not going to go sue for a hundred thousand so in this way you can kind of adjust it you can say okay well if your SaaS solution breaks down if i lose all my data i got to notify you know hundreds of thousands of people my secondary loss to this is billions of dollars well i can sue five times the amount i paid let's say i paid two hundred fifty thousand dollars so i can sue for you know 1.2 1.3 million dollars um and that one now it's a sizable amount of money so when someone transfers risk to me so their internal control environment doesn't exist, they can't evidence how they're protecting my data, my risk of using this software vendor goes up, so I need to mitigate that risk somehow. This is a great way to do it. I'm going to raise my limitation of liability so that the longer that I'm with this particular risky vendor, the more I can sue for. So I paid 100000 the first year. I can go five times that. The next year I paid an aggregate $200,000, now I can sue for a million. The next year I paid an aggregate $3 million, now I can sue for you know, three, 300,000 times five. But the caveat here is that if you persist with a vendor for a certain amount of time and didn't ever go back and look at their control environment, then a judge is gonna be like, hey, you're suing these for the aggregate of like five years of business. How come from one, years one to five, did you never go back to the vendor and say fix your internal control environment? So there's, you don't. It's not a get out of jail free card. It's a risk management card. What it is, and you have to continue to go back year after year with the high risk vendor and ask for their SOC two, type two report again, and make sure they're continuing to do their controls. Transfer risk by not paying for it. Yeah. I care about test evidence. So <laughs> he asked if uh, bridge letters. Yeah, for me, it's, I mean, it's, it's obvious. The way I manage my vendors, the same way I manage my team, it's results, results, results. If there isn't a result, there, nothing matters. So a promise, 
doesn't matter. I'm going to do this in like 18 months. doesn't matter. Like what matters is what do you have in place now? What are you producing now? What kind of result can you point to now? And if you can't point to anything, then you didn't do anything. That's just kind of how it goes. So results, results, results. The only way you can tell true behavior is by results. So someone tells you, hey, I'm the nicest guy ever. And then they're not like to your face ever. Okay. Like they're not the nicest guy, right? The, the result that they continue to create over and over again is one of meanness. So in reality, you're a mean person just telling me that you're nice. It's no different with vendors. See, I got this great control environment. Here's my attestation letter. Okay, that's great, but I need, you need to show me some results. So, so yeah, don't, bridge letters don't really do anything. Um, so here's transfer risk by not paying for it. Uh, there's a um, there's a risk management methodology called FAIR. It's kind of new. It's gaining traction. But it's a way to assess risk and then put a dollar sign on it on a bell-shaped type curve. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of cool. So at the end, you can assess risk and you can say, well, if this bad event happens, it's going to cost me between 150000 and 450000 depending on the magnitude and how long this thing persists. So if I'm going to put a control in, right, I don't put in a $5 million control for a $450,000 risk. Well, that's what this methodology does. That's, uh, that's really cool. And there's ways to automate it. We won't go into it. But if you performed a factor analysis of information risk, a fair analysis on a SaaS vendor and came to the conclusion that this, in a breach scenario, they're going to cost me X amount of dollars, I suppose you could try to argue a little bit off the top with that. You could use VRM as a negotiation tool. saying, you know what? I like your product. I want to use it. It presents to me this much risk, and so it's only worth this much to me. Um, so that's one way. I think it's going to happen within three years. So uh, that's that's going back to the cyber risk. So everyone's going to be looking to purchase cyber risk insurance. They're they're saying they're forecasting it's going to increase sixty percent. So anyone looking at markets is like setting up their their cyber risk companies to profit from this. So Jeremiah Grossman is a great example. If you go Google Jeremiah Grossman, his new company, and see what he's about, he's about capitalizing on people uh, purchasing cyber insurance. Right, that's what he's doing right now. Um, there's going to be others like him, but I think what you're going to see happen is there's, there's this massive gap in the insurance industry where people are paying premiums and then they get breached. And then the insurance company says, well, it's not my fault. Sorry. And then they go to court and they argue this out and somebody wins. Um, I've read through cyber insurance contracts and some of my favorite stuff is like you're reading through like, oh, this sounds great. And then you get to the the one section where like out, 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 out. The, the insurance company wrote in tons of outs. And here's one of them that I read once. If if a manager or supervisor above is re, is a part of the breach, is responsible in some regard, we're not paying. So then the question is, if a manager clicks on a, a weaponized PDF and that's the entry point that leads to a breach, insurance company is going to point to that section and be like, well, we said if a manager was involved, we're not paying. Right, so if you go back to the insurance company, you ask about that particular scenario, well, they can't really give you an answer because their actuaries don't know how to calculate that. Um, I think that's gonna change. Um, and there'll be, I think there'll be new standards. I don't know what they'll be, but I kind of think that you're gonna see this FICO thing um, evolve and other companies are gonna get involved and there's gonna be actuarial type offerings and people are gonna adopt it and eventually it'll lead to some new standard that if you don't assess your environment against the standard and, and present a score, then you're either going to be kind of like left out or seen as not mature enough to deal with or et cetera. It seems logical, but it's a guess. It's a guess. Well, I don't know if we have... Oh, yeah. So... That's basically all I have. Um, I do want to run through this. We'll probably post this someplace. But anyone doing vendor risk assessments or who cares about 
this topic in a great deal. He wants to know what kind of things should I be concerned about writing in the contracts? Question? Oh, okay, got it. Okay. So this is just a risk dump um, of everything that I've ever researched or cared about or pulled out of some other material or looked up on the internet that is a risk associated with moving to a cloud for a service. Um, and I just put them all here. I'm not gonna go through them all, but um, I highlighted a few that I thought were interesting. Um, so reputation activities of other tenants may affect electronic reputation, especially if utilizing a shared subnet. And I specifically cited email and web filters. Why? Because my email filter is in the cloud. And when I stood it up or my team did, et cetera, um, one of the IPs was kept getting blocked and mail wasn't being received. And it was because the previous tenant sent out a lot of emails and was on a blacklist and I got their IP address. So we had to work with them to like get a new IP address. Um, another one, cloud provider failures, acquisitions and mergers could come without warning or impact on your application. So you just moved your business to the cloud. They decided, you know what? We're gonna merge with this other company and your product may or may not went out. And then that goes back to this previous one about data and application lock-in. Well, how easy it is it to then export your data out of that solution into the next one you want if you want to rip and replace. Um, so there's some risks there. Another one, vendors always oversubscribe and an oversubscribe software as a service offering can impact the quality of service to organizations. So there's one vendor um, that we use. It's a cloud vendor. Again, at Casey's, we have more cloud solutions than about the rest of the business combined in this security team alone. Uh, so we use a lot of them. We've gone through this a lot, but uh, here's one of them is they oversubscribe. They have too many clients and then their software, their infrastructure, their network, something can't handle it. Performance degrades. Um, and, uh, you know, when it comes to should we sign on this company for X amount of dollars or should we improve our equipment? Sometimes the sales teams are ahead of the engineers. Um, and that could cause a problem. Uh, another one's follow the money in general. What costs a cloud provider money is often not done. So I could patch your system against this vulnerability, but it's going to cost me a lot of money and risk. I may bring customers down. I may have SLAs that are affected. So I might not just do it because it's going to cost me too much money to patch it. And then I'm just not going to tell you about it. And I don't have to because this isn't in my SOC 2 type 2 report, right? So that's a risk. Um, Another one, forensic recovery of the data is possible by other cloud tenants. So keep that in mind, especially in multi-tenancy type architectures. Uh, proper disposal, cost money may not happen by the cloud provider. So when they're tearing down your instance, if you move to a different instance, they might not, you know, DOD seven times wipe your data. Um, they uh, might just throw it in a dumpster out back and, you know, somebody picks it up. Uh, denial of service could happen indirectly via co-tenant activity. So we like to think hackers are going to cause a denial of service, but somebody else who's sharing that infrastructure with might actually be the one who causes it, uh, whether knowingly or not. Um, attackers could target bandwidth constraints by the cloud fighter. So can't hit the app directly, so maybe I'll impact bandwidth in some regard. Um, I'll do an economic denial of service. Uh, this is probably one of the more important ones, this last one here. Public clouds should have a larger security program to account for economies of scale. So right with VRM, if we are assessing a vendor, we're thinking, okay, you should protect my data better than I do. So you're comparing your, comp your security program with theirs. Um, the, uh, in, in this case, if they're really, really large provider like a ServiceNow, um, an ADP, uh, some of these kind of really big companies out there, like you should ask them about their security program. How many people do you have in it? What do they do? Do you have a SOC? How many people analyze it? Is it 24 seven? Do you use any third party outsource solutions in your security program? Like you want to gauge if their security program is to scale. It's like you have 1800 customers. You should have like 1800 times my security program, right? like economies of scale. So make sure you pay attention to that. Um, and this is another interesting one for anyone who's got worldwide business. Uh, process for handling seizures of co-tenants hardware may not be defined. You might not have contracted around this. You've got a data center sitting in Singapore. 
uh, that's been seized by some government agency that might not be the United States uh, because one of your co-tenants is doing illegal stuff um, and all your data went with it, what do you do? I don't know. It could happen domestically. Um, so there's some other ones here. Uh, recently I added API security management. Um, APIs are code. Maybe they should be scanned, scrutinized um, a little bit more. Uh, so there is just a risk dump here of all the things that could be considered. That's all I got. Any other questions? James? Um, so, so for those who don't know anything about Casey's security program, which James does because he works at Casey's now. Uh, um, so one of the reasons why we look at cloud solutions first sometimes in security is because I want analysts doing analyst work. I don't want analysts upgrading systems um, and spending time dealing with fallout of upgrading systems. I want them looking for security threats. So I try to figure out all the ways I can get to simplify operations so that I have security people doing security work. So if you're a security person, you're like not threat hunting because you got all these other maintenance and support and issues. That's what we're trying to avoid a lot of cases by going to the cloud. So I got to factor that in, right? If I have a security team that's not doing security work, they're just kind of maintaining systems work, then what risk does that pose to my detection program? That's why we look at cloud. So do I feel like I'm making progress in VRM? I feel like I'm plowing ground because every security vendor that we deal with, it's like we're asking them questions they've never been asked before in their history of selling their product. So what that tells me oftentimes is, is that other people out purchasing SaaS solutions don't give a shit about VRM. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how else to explain it. There isn't a demand, so the supply isn't there. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of the point of this presentation is if we start generating that demand and start asking these questions and then the minute some cloud providers lose a sale to another competing cloud provider because of their security, then they're gonna wake up and invest in it. And I think probably one of the interesting spaces now is the endpoint detection and response space because there's like 20 different vendors who all have a cloud in instance because they're doing some kind of backend analytics that just isn't possible with an on-premise solution. So you buy this endpoint, you know, detection and response solution that reports right to a cloud instance. Well, there's so many of those and the, the competition is so high among them that it's really easy to be like, you know what, this company over here has, is gonna protect my data better, my endpoint data, which is kind of important. Um, and so I think we can expect more and, and get more from some of these highly competitive uh, market spaces. So, uh, so one of the things we do at Casey's <laughs> is, uh, is we get the SOC 2 type re 2 reports from Amazon and Microsoft and any of the big key players, because why should they be left out? Like just because they're so big. Um, uh, one of the recent Amazon report had some interesting findings in it. And I signed an NDA so I can't talk about them, but if you sign an NDA and you get Amazon's report, you're gonna see that they're not perfect. Uh, and nobody is, in fact, no SOC 2 type re 2 report is ever perfect, um, Casey's isn't perfect, uh, but you'll find some interesting things that might make you question, say, just glossing over not looking at their security closely at all. Um, they need to be held to a, a high standard too. And, and again, uh, if, if there's anything, the beginning of my presentation was about business because that's what these are, these are businesses, making business decisions about how they make, how they become profitable. Um, and so they're they're gonna they're gonna cut corners where they can uh, if it's gonna generate more profit, and that doesn't always mean a good thing for your security. So we gotta find this balance between what I'm willing to accept and what they're.
provide and kind of meet in the middle somewhere on that and uh, so that we're not accepting all the risk and not taking all on. Uh, so there is a partnership with your vendors. and uh, So I don't have an opinion about who's better. Um, I just know that they need to be run through a, a vendor risk program as well. I don't know if that answers the question. They're not perfect. <laughs> Sweet. So that wraps up SecDSM for tonight. Um, next month we are meeting in December. December 18th will be the third Thursday. Uh, there was a quick vote that we had on one of our Slack channels. So I'll tell you, if you guys aren't on Slack, want to have input into SecDSM, please join Slack. If nothing else, join Slack because there's a whole lot of shit posting that goes on during the day. Um, it's always a good time. So join Slack, uh, have input into what Suck DSM, make, make it what you want it to be, right? So we're here for you guys, right? So um, have a say into it. Uh, stick around for a little bit, I think. Uh, have some beer, buy some shirts. Uh, because of Ryan Heckman's great donation, the shirt sales, 100% goes back to Suck DSM. So we'll be doing some really awesome stuff uh, through next year. Um, hopefully we'll be announcing some stuff uh, it will have a huge impact onto our community with uh, with next year. So um, know that those shirt sales go to fund a much bigger effort that will be coming up. Um, I don't want to talk too much about it because I want it to be a, a good surprise. So uh, otherwise, yeah, drink some beer, hang out for a little bit, chit chat with your coworkers and peers here, and uh, have a good night, guys.